Okay, we are going to go through a number of different mechanisms. I just want to give you a warning before we go into it. Um, lots of different mechanisms coming up here. And um, it's good, feel free to just pause the video between each one, sort of take a minute to absorb what is going on. Um, let's start with, this is a general overview um, regarding nonpolar hormones. So hormones that are able to cross through the plasma membrane. And um, in this case, I'm just gonna kind of point on the slide here. In this case, what happens is the hormone, which is shown in blue, the hormone starts off in the blood and it's attached to some sort of a carrier protein that shovels it around through the bloodstream. So this is circulating all throughout the body. And um, when this hormone makes it nearby its target cell, what's going to happen is dissociation of the hormone from the carrier protein. And then this is a lipophilic hormone, so it is capable of just crossing through the plasma membrane. It can go across, it will diffuse into the cell. And then inside of the cell, there's some sort of a receptor. So receptor binding will take place in the cytoplasm. And something to, to sort of clarify right here, and when you're reading about these sorts of receptors, you'll read of them being called nuclear hormone receptors. Why is it called a nuclear hormone receptor? It's hanging out in the cytoplasm. Uh, the reason that it is called a nuclear hormone receptor is because once the hormone binds, um, this whole structure becomes activated to go into the nucleus. So it's headed into the nucleus next. All right. Um, this receptor that's shown in green, okay, so it's bound to a hormone now. The other end is capable of binding to DNA. So once it's in the nucleus, um, DNA binding will take place. And that results in this whole complex um, becoming active as a transcription factor. So that is actually going to turn on a gene that is in the DNA. So it binds to what would be called the promoter sequence for a gene and it activates transcription. So here's some mRNA that's being produced um, and then that mRNA of course can go and be translated um, and a protein will be made from it. <clears throat> okay. Another category of lipophilic hormones are thyroid hormones. These are produced by the thyroid. And I just wanna show you um, kind of a breakdown of, of how thyroid hormones do what they do. It's extremely similar. Okay, so thyroxine is one thyroid hormone. A thyroxine has four iodines, and so sometimes it's abbreviated T4. Um, so T4 likewise starts off circulating in the bloodstream and um, once it makes it to its target cell, it will dissociate from its carrier protein, okay, just like what we saw on the previous slide. It will cross over the plasma membrane, so now it's inside of the cell. Inside of the cell, one of those iodines gets removed, uh, so T4 gets converted to T3, now it just has three iodines, and T3 um, can bind to a receptor. Okay, so there's a binding protein and um, that, that binding protein, uh, once it is bound, that whole structure will go into the nucleus, or rather, I'm sorry, the binding protein carries T3 to the nucleus, and then T3 goes inside of the nucleus, binds its receptor inside of the nucleus, so that's the thing that's different in this case, particularly different from um, on the last slide. Here the receptor is in the nucleus, and binding of T3 causes the receptor protein to become an active transcription factor. So extremely similar. Um, the receptor protein in this case, it starts off already bound to the DNA, but it's not active as a transcription factor until T3 binds. So that's, uh, those are two mechanisms, examples of nonpolar hormones and the way that they work. So they're just able to go straight inside of the cell and um, bind to a receptor inside of the cell. In contrast to that, we can talk about hormones that are polar. So if it's a polar molecule, it's not going to be able to cross the plasma membrane unless it had some sort of special transport mechanism in place. Um, but in general, polar hormones bind to the surface of the plasma membrane. There's a receptor embedded in the plasma membrane. And that's going to, um, binding is going to initiate some sort of a second messenger system inside of the cell. Second messengers, we've mentioned these before in passing. We'll see them in a lot more detail now. We're gonna look at 
three mechanisms. So again, take your time as you go through this. Um, take it, take it one at a time. Um, adenylate cyclase. This is the CAMP messenger system, cyclic AMP, and we'll look at these other two as well. So we've got one slide for each of these different second messenger systems. All right. So polar hormones. Okay. First example. All right, um, so hormones such as epinephrine and norepinephrine, these are good examples of hormones that cannot cross the plasma membrane. So what they will do is bind to a receptor on the cell surface, the receptor is in orange right here. That receptor is associated with a G protein. G proteins, remember what they do, and when they're activated, they dissociate and they diffuse through the plasma membrane, um, go and bind to other structures and activate them. So in this case, what will happen is the alpha subunit activates adenylate cyclase. This is an enzyme that's normally present in the plasma membrane. Okay, so once the alpha subunit binds to adenylate cyclase, that activates this enzyme. So now it's going to have an active site that will do something. And what it's gonna do specifically is take an ATP molecule, an energy molecule, and strip off two of the phosphates um, and convert the remaining molecule into a, a cyclic form. So it becomes cyclic AMP or CAMP. CAMP then does something interesting. It goes over um, and binds to another molecule and binding to this molecule um, causes, causes the regulatory unit to fall off. And as a consequence of that, this protein kinase becomes active. So kinases, remember what kinases do. Kinases are a type of enzyme that phosphorylate other things. Um, so now this protein kinase is able to phosphorylate and cause signaling cascades inside of the cell. Um, and this is all through a second messenger system. In the end, you know, there has to be a way to turn off this signal. And in the way that that, the way that that is done is by inactivating CAMP. And CAMP can be inactivated by this enzyme, phosphodiesterase. And just as an aside, um, this is one of the things that caffeine actually does if you drink coffee or tea or anything like that. Um, one of the things that caffeine does is it inhibits this enzyme, phosphodiesterase. So essentially CAMP is inhibiting Sorry, caffeine is inhibiting the breakdown of CAMP. And so these signaling pathways stay active longer than they, than they normally would. Um, so that's just one example of what caffeine can do. Okay, next system is the phospholipase C system. And this one, it's gonna start off the same way. Um, epinephrine is the hormone that we're using here. So just before we get too confused, let me go back and forth between these slides a couple of times. Previous slide, okay, we said hormones epinephrine and norepinephrine, they use this CAMP system. Now on the next slide, we're saying epinephrine can use this phospholipase C system. So we have one hormone that can uh, activate two different, two different sorts of systems, and the difference is in the receptor. So which type of receptor is it binding? We've said that adrenergic receptors, like these, adrenergic receptors come in two varieties. There are alpha and beta types. Um, so depending on which of those types are bound, a different system will be activated. So this gets really complex. Um, on the previous slide, we were talking about beta adrenergic receptors. This was a beta adrenergic receptor. Now we're dealing with an alpha adrenergic receptor. So anyway, uh, let's see here. Our hormone binds to its receptor, and that again is going to activate a G protein. This time the G protein um, activates something else. So this time instead of adenylate cyclase, this time we're gonna activate phospholipase C. And phospholipase C, once it is activated, it will use some of the membrane lipids and convert them into a couple of other forms. We're gonna focus in on IP3. This is a molecule that is produced by phospholipase C. And IP3 um, will diffuse through the cytoplasm over to the endoplasmic reticulum. Remember back when we talked about uh, membrane potentials and calcium, we said that inside of the cell, calcium is kept in really low concentrations. So there are pumps that transport calcium out of the cell and there are other pumps that transport calcium into the endoplasmic reticulum. That's a storage site for calcium. 
What IP3 does is it diffuses over to the endoplasmic reticulum and causes calcium um, to leave. Calcium can now come out of the endoplasmic reticulum. So this is going to temporarily raise the calcium concentrations inside of the cell in the cytoplasm. That's the phospholipase C system. Okay, two of three down. Let's look at the last one. The tyrosine kinase system. This is our last example of a second messenger system. Okay, tyrosine kinase. This system is a little bit different style. Um, in this system, there are two receptor, well, each one is kind of like half a receptor. There are two molecules that are in the plasma membrane and they're associated together, they're a dimer. Okay, the uh, hormone molecule, insulin is the example we're using in this case, the hormone molecule comes and binds to the receptor, the dimer, and that binding initiates a phosphorylation event. And this is kind of strange. What's gonna happen is this half of the dimer will phosphorylate uh, the other one, and this half of the dimer will phosphorylate the one on the right. So they phosphorylate each other. This is called autophosphorylation. Okay, so now they both have a phosphate group. You can see those little uh, red phosphate groups shown there. And once those phosphate groups are in place, this whole end of the receptor in purple, this whole end becomes active. And it is going to uh, do some stuff. Okay, so this is going to act as, um, as a tyrosine kinase and that will cause a phosphorylation of signaling molecules, which are just shown in blue down here. Um, the main takeaway is this whole end, once it's active, it is a kinase, and it will go and phosphorylate other things in the cytoplasm. And then that can set up a whole signaling cascade, again, inside of the cell. Okay, um, so with that, that was a huge amount of information that I just gave you. That was enough for a whole entire lecture if we were in person together. Um, that would be it for the day. Um, so again, make sure to take some time to digest all of this. And what we're going to do next is go through specific glands of the endocrine system and see what each one does. So I think good news, the hard part is out of the way going through these mechanisms. Um, what's up next is going through some specific examples of different glands.